Uh, just quick show of hands. Who is familiar at all with Sun's Thin Client? Okay, so why am I talking? Um, <laughs> I'll dance through all the marketing stuff, um, but there's there's a there's an adage inside of Sun right now that that Sunray or Ultra Thin Client Computing is about to be the 12 year overnight success because uh, we have been doing this for about 12 years with a zero admin client and it is really starting to take off and it's taking off in a number of different areas that I'll go through but this is this is really kind of where all of us live today how many have more than one computational device that sits on their desk right even Sun employees we all have Sun rays and we bring in laptops and everything else um, in my own house I've got no fewer than probably five PCs um, now that's in addition to the fact that all my kids have sun rays in their bedrooms. Uh, that's the way I keep an eye on them. But anyway, we'll keep going. So traditional PC, you know, I, I, I really I detest slides. I truly do. Um, but what this is this is about is not about Sun trying to sell you on getting it on Open Solaris or Solaris on your desktop. Um, we understand enterprises now uh, 95 plus percent are all running Windows XP. Um, now the move to Vista is a wonderful time, as the Apple commercial says, is the time to change. Um, so I'm looking forward to jumping on the tail end of that. But it's really about interacting with user data, whether that user data is personal data or it's corporate data. It's interacting with the data. And that data, more often than not, is locked to the user's desk because the device that they have is the only device authorized to access it. Um, I spent some time with a company, the, the CFO contacted me and asked me to, to come in and, and talk and he says, if I could get his money back off his investment within 10 years, he'd do thin client. So well, that's an easy one, we can, we can pull this one out. So I spent two days um, in an in-depth set of meetings understanding the user profiles, something that the customer had never spent time doing. I asked for sysadmins in the room, I asked for end user customers along with senior management in the room. And what they realized, they didn't know how users worked. They had no idea what they did on a day to day basis. The people who had the, the closest approximation of what users did was actually the sysadmin community. They were the closest. They still didn't have it all. They still kind of scratched their heads and said, that's why you do it. But this is an organization that had 140,000 desktop devices. And you know what their file sharing mechanism was? Email. Not just file sharing, I'm gonna send a copy of a presentation to Glenn, it's I'm going from campus A to campus B, I'll email it to myself, because it takes too long for it to sync up. So I'll email it, get on the other end, download it as a guest in that, in that facility, give my presentation and leave. The problem was they backed up all 140,000 desktops every night. I said, did you ever try to restore this? And they said, no. I said, it won't work. So I recommended they not try thin client computing because they didn't have a computational problem, they had a data management problem. I said, fix the data management, we can talk. So really, that's one way of saying what's on that slide. Nice marketing slide, but it tells the story. Um, this is a, a, a kind of an image that Sun has been using for a number of years now, talking about the, the desktop, um, really the direction where it's going. So on the far left, we've got a very stateful device where we've got applications and data resident. Um, the closest thing we have to that today, the closest that we have today, is probably our laptops. Because we're taking data with us, we're taking some application with us. Um, but I would argue that we're not there anymore. It's gone. Um, we're somewhere in the middle here where applications and data come from someplace else. Right? If, I got a couple nods in the room. I've, I've done this in front of some senior execs and they'll, they'll shake their head, no, no, no we are stateful, everything is on the device. And I said, really? What's the number one app your users use? And they think for a little bit. And, and after a little while, I, I, I tell them the app that they don't know they're using the most, and that is, you know, we've, I'll just give you an example. Inside of Sun, we have wonderful search tools for looking for things. Um, but the number one app used is Google. And Google's not resident, <laughs> right? No one installed it. It's living on the web somewhere. Yes, there may be some data local, there may be some application local, but for, for the most part, we've moved a lot of it out into the cloud, out onto the network somewhere. Where we see things going is to the far right. And that's where you take the operating system, the data, the application, you take all of it, put it on the web someplace, and dial in. Basically, get the access you need when you need it. So that's really what this is about, is moving to the right. 
So time to have fun. Oh, by the way, I am between you and lunch. So the quicker you respond to the questions, the faster you go eat. And I, I can talk very quick, so I can finish this short if you'd like. But what do these have in common? Come on, throw it out. Come on, Dave. I know I can count on you to throw something out. <laughs> That's good. What's that? Very good. How many televisions do you have in your house? By the way, who bought a television in the last two years? Okay, when you bought it, did you call your cable company to ask if it was on the hardware compatibility list? Right? So what can we learn from this? Right? These devices, iPods, there's six iPods in my house. Right? That's just my house. No one manages them. My son thinks he does. What he manages is what I allow him to see. But it comes down to the very bottom. They're all uninteresting without power and network. They're somewhat useless devices. The television's a useless device unless you have power and network. So what can we learn from that? Let's simplify it. Right? A TV is, is a well-known device that knows how to communicate over a few different frequencies, and it does a job for us. So why don't we simplify it? We'll just display over IP. Right? This is the thin client model from Sun. Different channels. Right? When I bought my TV, yes, I wanted it for sports primarily, but my kids watch, of all things, my son is now into Home and Garden Channel. I'm not sure if I should be worried or not. But, <laughs> Home and Garden Channel, Dancing with the Stars, whatever it is, it's not just a sports television. I have multiple channels and I need to be able to tune to those. No different than your organization now. Even an organization that is 100% Windows on the desk has different derivatives of that Windows environment. Agree? Right? There is no one channel. Everyone has something a little different. So we should be able to tune to the channel that we need. The other one is to be able to mix and match channels for different purposes. Right, we can think of this in the next slide a little bit like um, you know, picture in picture on that television set. Right, there may be a good reason to run Linux as a desktop. There may be a good reason. There may not. There may be a good reason to run Solaris or Open Solaris. But there's also a good reason to go up and run Excel on win you know, from, window from a Windows environment. I should be able to pop a window open, get access to it. It's about access to data and mission function. Period. End of statement. I should be able to get to anything I need from anywhere based on policies. Just like my TV that I bought, I wanted a big screen, right? So come in different shapes and sizes. And this, this one really starts to show a number of different interfaces and how we call out to each of those interfaces. Those interfaces happen to be you know, SAP running on a mainframe, right? Just because I have a, a, a Solaris desktop doesn't mean my requirements for accessing these, these organizational requirements uh, go away. 3270, Word, running Windows 2000, right? Is this a surprise to anybody? I mean, this is, this is the real world, right? We like to think everyone's running Star Office, right? We like to think that MySQL is the only database. It's not, right? There are things other than a Solaris desktop. So what about, anybody need to ha have Zenorama? Yeah. Well, this is, it's been working for years. I'll give you an example here. What, what he's referring to is, is the ability to take two devices, chain them together with a single keyboard and mouse, but have the display spanning monitors. This is uh, the, di uh, the, the piece at the top is a little misleading. It says up to 16. Um, yes, we can take 16 disparate Sunray devices, gang them together with a single keyboard and mouse, and have one big video wall. Um, I did this six years ago at a show. The hardest part of it was finding the mouse. Right? Anybody that's ever done this, knows, whether it's with Sun or something else, you know that that's a challenge. You need really big mouse pointers. Um, this number, though, is, is inaccurate because the Sunray 2FS device has twin DVI feeds out of it, which means I can do two monitors off a single device. So that number goes to 32 out of the box. Um, more than happy to talk to you about what may or may not be working. We pop through some of these. And, Okay. Um, so, by the way, this talk is about thin client. So this is a rather strange slide, but thin clients aren't interesting when you get to the core of it. It's not about the device. 
None of this is about the device. Once you accept the fact that you need to be able to isolate the operating system, the data, and the application away from the device, the device doesn't matter. Right? I came up, yes, we had a small compatibility issue because I left my DVI VGA connector, but I didn't call ahead to the hotel to find out whether or not the Mac was on the HCL for the projector. I just plugged it in. That's what this is saying. It's about what am I here to do. Right now I'm giving a presentation. A little while later you're going to have a demonstration. Um, all the security talks today, none of us communicated ahead of time to find out what, what um, uh, point font the monitor is going to accept. Right? That's what this is saying. Understand the mission requirement, the business requirement, just deliver it to the device, period. So since we're at a security talk, I had to have one side about real security. Um, the thing I want to note is everything that's been talked about prior to me walking up here, I was trying to make notes and I stopped writing. Um, it's all applicable in this thin client model. The keynote this morning when he talked about you know, uh, mergers and acquisitions, those are good times to change. A rollout of thin client is a good time to change the way in which you handle passwords because once you establish and you publish to the devices, you're changing a few systems in the back. Instead of changing the 2,000 uh, uh, PCs throughout the organization, when you move to a thin client model, you change them back in the data center where they belong, where those changes, you have full control over them. Um, real quick, does anybody think uh, a data center or, a, or a, even a, you know, smart guys like, like, like you um, have full control over what the user can do on the device in which you've provisioned to their desktop? Anyone think they have full control? <laughs> Not in this room. Um, if you move to a truly stateless device, you have full control. You can say where they can go, when they can go, what they can do, what they can't do. You could track them the entire time. All the auditing stuff that he was just talking about, it's all there. So, thin client computing, it's a policy driven model. You define what that policy is. Right? What do I mean by policy? You define whether or not the unit is allowed to connect to the server in the first place. There are features that are put into the into the software now where we can take the fingerprint, much like the, the you know, fingerprints that he was just talking about, we take a fingerprint of the DTU, the desktop unit, and we put it in a data store, and at the flip of a switch, I can turn off all non, all systems that are not in my fingerprint database, which means if someone went off and, and grabbed a rogue device and just plugged it in and somehow was able to get onto the network, I could turn it off at the flick of a switch. That's a new feature, right? It's one of those ones that moving forward as we start really securing these environments we need. So we're adding it into the, into the feature function. This is not something that requires a new device in order to implement. We just change the software on the back in the area in which we control. Whether or not we turn on encryption of the, of the data path, which uh, would, appears to be the data path between the endpoint device and the server, we can turn on encryption, turn off encryption. Um, authentication, what authentication model is required? Do you require the use of a smart card in order to get access to a, uh, to a challenge response? Or is the smart card somehow tied into a naming service and you require to unlock the this, this smart card? In, um, I think he said, I, I spent a lot of time in DoD Intel space, the whole CAC card and HSPD 12 type model. Um, unlock the, the smart card in order to get some credential off of it to then answer a challenge response to the to the device that I'm carrying with me. All that's possible. It's policy driven. You put the policy in place, you define it, we'll enforce it. Um, stateless connectivity. When I say stateless, this is one of the things that separates Sun's thin client delivery from virtually every other thin client out there. There is no operating system running on the device. It's firmware. It's an LCD projector. What are you plugging in the back? That means I have, no, I have zero point of attack at the endpoint device. So if I have 2,000 devices out in my organization and 100 servers in the back, I can remove 2,000 entry points from a virus or from someone you know, maliciously trying to in, in, uh, get into my network. Access control, I talked a little bit about the DT, uh, DTU fingerprint. Um, if you get a chance, we're gonna do, we'll do the demo later today. I'll, also, I'll be you know, playing the role of booth babe, um, doing, doing a de <laughs> demo. I didn't say an attractive one. <laughs> um, 
But the, the demo that, I, that I'm going to show is, is tied to the use of smart cards, but not for authentication purposes. Each smart card is going to give me a different view of something inside the enterprise. So when you, you insert the smart card, you're delivered a different user experience based on a role. Right? So my role may be I'm just a Windows XP guy and I need PowerPoint. Um, but Glenn's role might be you know, he's a multi-level guy, so I'm going to give him a multi-level desktop. I'm not changing the device, I'm changing the service in the back dynamically. So uh, the last thing, down the bottom, different techniques. If you've, just about everyone raised their hand is familiar with Sun's Thin Client. Um, are you familiar with kiosk mode? Okay, just general, wake up, you're almost about to eat. Okay, some people are familiar with kiosk mode. From Sun, there, there's kind of two different, role, two different ways in which you run a, a, um, a thin client device. The one is you get the default operating experience that the system you connect to is. So if I, if I install the Sunray Session software on a, on a Red Hat box, I'm getting a Red Hat desktop. If I install it on the Solaris box, I get a Solaris desktop. There's another mode to it, though, and that is on the session server, you can enable something called kiosk mode. Kiosk mode, right out, perhaps my battery died. No. Um, right out of the chute opens a security hole, and I'll tell you that right off the bat. Um, we have the ability to use anonymous users to deliver services for us. So what happens in kiosk mode is I, I give an application that I wish to run and the system runs it on behalf of the endpoint device. The reason I say it's a security hole is I haven't authenticated yet. So I'm doing something on behalf of someone else. Now that user that's performing the work, when the session ends, gets destroyed. So the directory goes away and re-instantiate the, the, um, uh, the user account and the directory. This is another area where role-based access control comes into play and privileges and authorizations. We can actually clamp them down a good bit and the applications which we provision through that kiosk um, are, we, we need to be careful of. To give you an example, I could create a kiosk application that opens Xterm. And now what I've done is I've given everyone Xterm on my system. <laughs> so there's the security hole. The, um, and somehow I'm going backwards. Um, other things that we can do in kiosk mode though is I can interrogate the MAC address of the unit look it up in the, some database to find out physically where it's sitting, and then provision an application to it based on where it's sitting. That's an example. I could wait for something else, just have a, you know, insert card to begin logo up on the screen. You insert the smart card, I read the serial number off the card, I look it up in a database and do something on behalf of that, that user. So that's what kiosk can give us. Yes, you can launch a browser, um, in a typical hotel kiosk type environment and, and give users access to an intranet of an organization or something like that. So the kiosk allows me to run basically anything I want from an administrative function. AMGH, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on, but basically it's the idea of grouping, um, uh, grouping session servers. We, we take session servers and we put them in groups. And in, inside of Sun, we do this with our Sun Federal Group. I'm, I'm actually inside of SunFed. And when my smart card goes into a DTU in Menlo Park, it looks up and says, oh, that's a member of SunFed. Let's move him over to the SunFed servers immediately. So I don't actually log in to the rest of Sun's network. I log into SunFed's network. Just an example. Administration, anyone administer SunRays? Okay, for those who haven't, the biggest feature function to the sysadmins that I like is the fact that there's no more round trips to find out what the user did to their desktop. When the user calls up and says, it's not performing well, I can't get into this application, the first thing you ask them, is there anything on the screen and right in the middle of it, it's this on-screen diagnostics. If there is, tell me what it says. If there's not, hold down these three buttons and it comes up and it gives you this, this information. The one on the left is the old version, the one on the right is the new version. That diagnostic screen tells me everything I need to know as to whether or not this is a Sunray problem or it's an application problem. Because I can read across and I've got the MAC address and the IP address on the left hand side. In the middle I see that I'm on a 100 megabit full duplex um, network that is not encrypted. That's what the unlock sign is. Um, and on the right hand side I see that I've authenticated that the server is a valid session server that I want to use and something is really going over my laptop. And the IP address of the server. What's more important is the bottom right-hand corner, 31D, tells me 
what the current state of that DTU is. I look it up on my, my little list and says 31 is waiting for this and the D means this. And I can tell exactly what it is without having to visit the, the user. I also know which Sunray session server they're on. So I can go to that server and look to see if we've got a problem. I'm trying to get through in six minutes to make sure everyone eats on time. More marketing oriented slides, but this is, this is really what we're seeing. Um, organizations are asking us. Centralize the, the resources. You know, VMware is making a killing in this space. Is let's take all your let's take all your desktops and virtualize them into VMs, and we'll put them back in the data center. And we'll manage them there. And nine times out of ten, what organizations fail to do is they take those two thousand desktops, they virtualize them into VMs, and put them in the in the data center. Now they have four thousand desktop images to manage because they didn't remove the device on the user's desk. What they've done is they've added another piece of software onto it, a client that goes off to find my old desktop. I still have to scan it for viruses. I have, still have to deal with memory, disk, everything else on the user's desktop. So now I've taken a problem of 2,000 users and, and created a problem of 4,000 users plus the servers. Increase in security. Um, we, we've talked a little bit about it, um, but the key is I have full control over that desktop environment that I do not have now. Uh, I've reduced the attack vector from you know, malicious or, or accidental. Um, streamlining management, I focused it. I can sit at a single console and look at all the session servers in my organization, find out the state, find out who's, who's logged in where. I can look to see what the current occupancy rate is, how many users are physically on the device using it, because I can query the sessions. Is the session authenticated? If so, by who? And I get an entire list. And I can see whether or not that session is encrypted, whether, you know, whether or not the applications are performing properly. I can see it all from a single, single pane of glass. Flexibility and access. This is the one, being a Sun employee, we forget that we have, um, but we've been doing it for years. And that is, if you're using smart cards, it's easy to understand. If you're not, it's a little bit more difficult to understand. But I take my smart card out of my unit when I leave my office and I move to another office or to my house and I put the card back in, everything I'm working on is now there. It's hot desking. We've had this now since 99. And just because I use it all the time, I almost forget to mention it. But that's flexibility. By the way, you know, you can read these, but I have a question real quick. Does anybody know what the d desktop standard is gonna be three years from now? Nobody knows what it's going to be in three years, but corporations typically buy on a three-year cycle. So we're buying machines that we're anticipating are going to be end of, you know, end of useful life in three years, but we have no idea what we're going to be running on them. So in addition to all these requirements, think, what are we going to be doing? Right? How many Macs are in the room? Right? Five years ago, if you said that, everybody like, Mac? Yeah, okay, they're, they're neat, they're special, they're niche, but now everyone has them. Right, so delivery of a Mac desktop could be the requirement in a year and a half. A couple different ways to do this. Um, moving left to right, far left is the, the traditional Sunray model where I put an endpoint device and I have multi-users logged into a, you know, a Solaris server. This is a perfect example though of, of uh, what we were talking about earlier with reduced privileges is when you do something like this, you put into the, into the basic privilege set, you know, pound proc info. Now the users think they're on a machine all by themselves. Sysadmins log in, do the PS, only thing they see is their own stuff. Um, the center is an approach that some of, um, honestly, some of our competitors are going after, and that is let's dedicate a blade in the data center for each user. That's a winner. Um, and the, the right side is where we're seeing a lot of uh, attraction, that is the whole VDI model. We're gonna create VMs and deliver those to, to end users. You know what, I'm not even gonna go through the other slides. To get started now, um, first off, define what it is that you're trying to do. That is often the longest step in this process, is define the actual goal. What are you trying to do? I joke about it, but I say, if the goal is to, is to light fiber at the end of a long run, in other words, it lit up, okay, you didn't, you know, that's easy. We can do that here. A Couple of laptops, we're done. Um, but define what the goal is. Why are you going down this path? Why are you even looking at the technology? Then 
plan for the cultural hurdle because this is not a t most of the time this is not a technical problem. It's a change management problem. Users don't like to give up the fact that they've had units sitting under their desk to keep their feet warm in the winter. Um, one of the biggest change management um, challenges I've had is exactly that. Friday afternoon, the project team decides we're going to take out all the thick clients. We're going to move in thin clients. You know what? That's fine. I'm going to just turn it off. Um, I've recommended to every one of them, don't do it. Leave the PC on. Leave the hum going. Just change the wires and Velcro the sunray under the desk. It works better than you think. <laughs> I have a customer pulled out 200 devices on a Friday afternoon, Monday morning, the help desk went nuts because they gave them all brand new 24-inch monitors, new polished keyboards, all the post-it notes with all the passwords were gone. Users went nuts. So I said, next time you do this, leave the PCs in place, do the Velcro underneath. I even had a customer turn off a PC, put a sunray inside and ran the cables out the back so it looked like it was a PC. Monday morning, nothing. Tuesday morning. Oh, those things, it seems snappier. Did we get a memory upgrade or something? Right? The cultural hurdle is bigger than the technical hurdle. This is a change management problem, not a technical one. Um, the rest of the bullets went along the line of um, plan what you're going to do. You already have the resources you need now to try this. Right? Sunray Session Software runs on x86, Spark, Linux, Solaris. It, it runs everywhere. Okay, so you can start with the prototyping and the testing. Will the application work? What you're going to find out is you have applications that don't work in time-sharing models. In the Windows world, that means an application that opens C colon backslash temp foo. Right? If you have applications like that, you can't run Windows 2003. You can't run Windows 2008 for that user. Then you have to be looking at a virtualization model. Right? Yes, I have other slides on how, how Sun does virtualization but you're looking at those. The next one is pick a couple candidate users and you're looking at the cultural side of the equation. A small group is easier to digest than a large group. Get a couple of champions in close and you'll be successful with it. So you already have most of what you need today. We've run over existing networks and everything else. Um, that's it and I am a minute and 40 seconds late for Thank lunch. Thank you. Well, we, we should still take a question or two. I mean, you are in between them and lunch, so <laughs> it's up to you if you want to ask now questions. Now, areas. Go ahead. one of the sun's cloud folks so yeah. <laughs> cloud experts but yes desktop as a service is really what you're talking about delivery of the desktop based on some some form of policy um, and and the cloud model fits very well with with exactly what we're doing And where's the server that you're connected to? Um, that was, the server was in the UK, and uh, my PCU was in the UK as well. So I, I then take my card back, go to California, get the same card back in the UK, and then go to the UK. When I moved to cable at home, and I got 20 meg cable, I couldn't tell the difference between being in the office on 100 meg network to the Sunway server and being home. I really could not tell the difference. And, some, and in some cases, my headquarters was actually faster. <laughs> yes, sir. Sun BI uses virtual box for desktop images today. It is uh, XVM, Xen, Muslers, 
It's the one slide that I didn't bring up, and that is the whole VDI delivery model. So basically what VDI is is a kiosk application that goes off and looks based on some set of credentials, goes and finds my VM somewhere. So your question is, um, what are we supported on now and, and will we support something else in the future? Today, our VDI solution supports VMware ESX. It supports Sun's VirtualBox, which if you get time, stop over the, the booth, I'd love to talk to you about it because it, it surprised quite a few people on how fast we can deliver a desktop. Um, and coming in another two weeks, or one week, I can't remember what today's date is, uh, will be Hyper-V support. So our virtualization plugins are those three today. Um, as far as moving forward, it's, it's one of these requirements gathering and, and business justifications and whether or not we have an API that we can, we can program a VM um, uh, recreation from. So if you have a requirement for it, let me know. Um, I have the, the folks here because uh, we're looking for new requirements. But right now, that's not, that's not one that is on the, on the roadmap. Anyone okay, else? great. Everyone hungry. Thank you. So lunch is served right outside.